Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Please sign in. Good to see everyone. Good morning. So that song was, uh, of course, We Are Family by Sister Sledge. That was suggested to us by Kathy Finney. Is uh, Kathy on yet? Yes, but I didn't know that I did recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take credit. Um, I'll just share real quick. I like the song. I love that song. <laughs> <laughs> My cousins were uh, 11 in the family and 10 of them were girls and they sang that all the time. So we knew it real well. <laughs> I said it just brings back warm memories and uh, barbecues and the like. Just that That's that song, you know? Shouting that, shouting that song at the top of our voices. <laughs> Plus, it's a uh, Women's History Month, so it's very anthropologic. Yes, love that song. So, if um, uh, those of you that are joining us now, please, if you can put your your name, your organization, and your title in the chat, and um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, and I'll just letting people in as we move along. All right. So again, as you guys know, um, we here at the Civic Lab, we're a black led uh, nonprofit, uh, community facing do tank uh, dedicated to accelerating and deepening grassroots democracy, civic engagement, social justice efforts through collaboration, education, innovation, and through partnerships like like now. Um, we seek to expand uh, civic imagination about what is possible in the Chicago's future. We're helping to recruit, develop, equip, and inform new leaders to take us to that future. And our method, as you know, is to investigate, fabricate, educate, activate, liberate, and repeat. Um, and that's what we do. Um, also, um, this is being brought to you through the Illinois Access to Justice, which is a statewide program that seeks to mitigate the de devastating consequences of incarceration and family separation of vulnerable communities by expanding effective and holistic community-based legal services, and also through uh, uh, providing authentic uh, training in local leadership for those that are affected uh, through uh, unjust policies and the like. Uh, and then also sharing experiences and best practices between partner organizations to increase capacity. Um, also, the Access to Justice program is administrated uh, or administered by the Resurrection Project and the West Side Justice Center, uh, which expands and improves access to legal representation and system navigation of uh, vulnerable families, uh, including documented uh, citizens here in Illinois, okay? And as you know, uh, the Civic Lab brings uh, many uh, trainings to you, uh, many of those that you've already partaken of. And here are some others. Uh, if you'd like to avail yourself of these other very impactful trainings, I would tell you to take a look at the uh, Power Institute website and see how you can register to take these uh, trainings, okay? All right, and you know us pretty well at this point. I'm Ama Johnson. Uh, co-founder and CEO of the Ubuntu Institute for Global Learning, which is a nonprofit school um, that I have uh, co-founded with a partner of mine. And also in terms of what we've been um, going through in terms of the trainings that we've been um, providing, uh, my expertise is in financial management and organizational development. Um, and so I've been in the, the arena of resource development fundraising for 30 plus years. Um, as a director um, through grants management as well on the other side, through an intermediary giving out money. Uh, and I've done both at the local, state and national level in terms of uh, fundraising for nonprofit organizations. Probably um, raised to the tune of uh, probably just under over 70 million, give or take. So extensive research uh, experience in that area. So Philip? Again, good morning, everyone. Phil Thomas, um, 
I um, have a background, long background in raising money from federal, local sources, foundations, government. I also was a senior program officer for Chicago Community Trust over community development, which included things like uh, civic engagement, community organizing, uh, housing policy, legal services, and a host of other things. I also was a program officer at the Woods Fund of Chicago, funding organizing and uh, community activism and uh, research, along with running their arts program. And uh, I've also run in organizations, uh, raised money. And so this is a very familiar terrain. And today is really meant to be a very kind of nuts and bolts practical kind of lab thing. So it should be fun. Uh, we're uh, anticipating a lot of interaction. So thank you for being with us today. So our agenda actually is as follows. We've just done um, introductions. Um, we're gonna do a recap of uh, institutional individual fundraising, sort of those two uh, umbrellas that we were, have uh, looked at over the past few weeks. Um, today, we're gonna be actually going through developing your elevator pitch for when you get in front of foundations and individual donors. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, cultivation again and um, also, we're going to do, we, with the cultivation, we're gonna have you guys look at your list. You're gonna develop lists and um, start to look at that individual donor pipeline or assess your individual donor pipeline. Uh, we're also gonna look at special events uh, and do some small group activity around that. And then we're gonna also um, go walk through a foundation guideline documentation and you are going to be looking at how your organization either aligns or does not align with um, the foundation guidelines and also some key things to look for when you are seeking uh, funding from an organ uh, a foundation and how you look to seek for alignment, okay? And then we're going to do our evaluation and check out and then we'll give you some information on the next upcoming sessions, okay? Um, so under this umbrella of financial management, which is what we've been looking at over the last uh, few weeks, um, we've been looking at fundraising and development and more specifically, who you approach and how you engage with foundations and institutions, as well as who and how to approach and engage individual donors, okay? So like, again, like I said, we're gonna drill down and help you develop a pitch that you can get take to either entity. Um, and then also uh, help you assess the guidelines when you are approaching the foundation, okay? So without further ado, Philip, take it away. Great, thank you, Anna. So the elevator pitch. Um, we're starting here, as she said, because um, this applies to both approaching an institution or individuals that really we've been framing everything in terms of relationship building when we're talking about fundraising and relationships start and end with, com with um, communication. And um, so this concept of an elevator pitch is one that comes from the idea of if you were uh, on an elevator and the, the kind of standard time of being on an elevator is about 118 seconds. So just imagine you were on an elevator and you just happen to be right there with uh, Elon Musk or, or Jeff Bezos or somebody, some deep pocket, and you have uh, eight, 118 minutes to shoot your shot to, to kind of convey things to them. And you'd like to have in your toolkit a way to do that. And it just, just so turns out that same kind of uh, tool is useful when you get on the phone with a funder for the first time. Or if you're talking to just a, a person you think might be a good donor or a volunteer or any kind of prospect, it's that still that way of communicating succinctly and effectively um, your, your mission, 
um, and which will help help you raise money successfully. And it gives them uh, a really good elevator pitch, encourages who you're talking to to take action in some way, either look you up or exchange cards or, you know, it's, a, it's, it's meant to generate a next step. And again, you got a small window of time to have that impact. So that's what we're talking about. Next slide, please. So the components then of this elevator pitch, it, should, it starts with the hook. It's that first 10 to 15 seconds that's meant to grab attention. It's meant to uh, deliver who you are, why you're different, What's the value of your work? What impact do you make in a way that's, again, accessible and um, gets right to the attention? When you're on the elevator with Elon Musk for 118 seconds, you don't have time for small talk. Uh, you have to get right to the matter. And people like that don't like their time wasted. And they, they appreciate that. They also get a lot of people doing the same sort of thing. So you want to be able to cut through all of that with the effectiveness. And you're, you're again, you're communicating one-on-one. -on -one. So it's about engagement. So in one sentence, we want to know who you serve, who, how you help them, and, and what's your impact. Now, let, we're going to use this example here on the screen to show you what we mean how you could take your uh, mission statement and start and use that as the basis of making this elevator pitch. And the first part, that opening, um, that's we're gonna go straight to that. So this is an example we're using. I tried to use uh, language that approximates the kind of things that most of the groups in both cohorts just generally see. So you could just see how we mean. So if you see that first example, uh, we seek to empower Chicago's low-income families by offering legal services and education programs to help them achieve equal justice and e economic stability. Now, that's a mouthful, okay? It's also, in terms of talking to someone one-on-one, -on -one is a little generic, and it has a lot of terms of art. And so if someone not necessarily really familiar with it might not be able to de decipher from that language, even if you could get that tongue twister out, they, it might not communicate the way you want to. So you wanna kind of get that down. So you do that by isolating main ideas, isolating the, the key words, the key descriptive terms or phrases. So if you see in this one, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm old enough for when you in English class, you still had to do a, sentence diagramming. I don't know if they do that anymore, but in elementary school, but here you're kind of inverting the predicate with the subject to bring that out front. Um, we offer legal services and programs. We help people achieve justice and economic stability. So those are, if you look at that first sentence, those are the two real components of that. So then you want to refine it by getting rid of the redundant language and going and kind of linking those together. And you come up with something like, we provide critical legal services to low income families that can't afford them. Now, doesn't that sound a little bit more kind of straightforward? And it's definitely shorter. And, and so, what do you provide? This is what we provide, who we provide it to, and why it's giving you a sense of the urgency and what the problem is you're addressing. So that's like kind of the tie in it. Oh, could you go back to that one more time? <coughs> the other thing that you want to remember about this is that if you have some kind of a if you've got some kind of a story or some kind of a statistic, keep that in mind. That might be something that you can pull in a success story or something that talks about how big the problem is. It's good to kind of put that maybe up front or other parts of the statement. So next slide. So then we go to the body. So the body 
is the meat. And it's not just how we do this. It's we do this for the people we serve. And this is how you, the person I'm speaking to, can be part of this work. All right. So that part of it should be 30 to 60 seconds, no more than 30, 60 seconds. And you describe the specific impact you serve, sir. Like what makes you different than other nonprofits in the same space? How effective are your programs? Do you have an amazing story about the impact? We serve this many people or we change this or that. And I, can that be put in a, a sh little short statistic or something? Um, can they get involved? And how can they get involved in what you do? And what are you trying to do in the future? And so the idea, again, is to get that across quickly and specifically. So next one. Talk. Yes, please. Hello, someone has a question? Maybe somebody went on mute, I don't know. Oh, okay. So the idea here is you're taking your, your mission statement that you look at all the time and makes sense and you're trying to bring it down into a shortened, more casual, personal type of way of communicating because that's how we hear things. And that's just much more uh, amenable to trying to get the results you want, which is their involvement of the person you're talking. So what we wanted to do is if you could all get your uh, mission statement, uh, we wanted to put you in groups and have you identify your key words from that mission statement. And then we just kind of reproduce that exercise that we talked about, having this short hook, maybe having some example of a statistic or a success story or something that kind of sums up what you're doing. And um, we're going to give you enough time to kind of whittle down your thing um, and simplify this in a small group. And then maybe you can run it off one another uh, very quickly. So this isn't meant to be a final pro product or anything like that. It's just to show you how you do this in this exercise. And some of the, you know, what we came up with some groups yesterday was pretty good. So um, it's meant to, it's not meant to be overly complicated. So does everybody understand what we're doing? You're getting your mission statement and you're going to whittle that down to those key words, key phrases, and something that you would say on that elevator. And then we're gonna look at it, maybe as someone is gonna, you know, uh, volunteer out of the group when we talk back and then we can reconstruct what they did. All right? All right, I'm sending you to your groups now. All right, welcome back, welcome. So I hope that was fun, <laughs> cutting things down. I did. It's, it's, this is a again. This is a work of progress, and the ear that you want to have is that if you didn't know anything about the organization, and this was said to you, you'd have an idea that would pique your curiosity and want you to make some further action, either an appointment, or maybe I want to volunteer or help in some way. So it just has to be succinct and clear enough and compelling. So out of your groups, you want to go group by group. And who was in group one? What, did you get to share it with each other? Or if there's somebody that, from group one that wants to share one, you could just put it in. Uh, if you have your mission statement, you could paste it into the chat. Or if you just want to say it. OK, so do you just want? the mission statement that we have yeah like start out with this the mission statement okay so i am at asses and our mission statement which to my knowledge is currently being revamped so you're getting the previous is to provide the expertise and navigational support for immigrants and citizens to become knowledgeable empowered members of society okay 
And then my elevator speech, I was still working on it. Okay, can, so. Can she read her mission statement one more time, please? Of yeah. course. Mm -hmm. So it is, and I'll do it a little bit more slowly. To provide the expertise and navigational support for immigrants and citizens to become knowledgeable, empowered members of society. Okay, let's go one layer deeper. What are your services and programs? Okay, I would need 15 minutes instead of 15 seconds. We have different departments at our organization. We have our legal department, which focuses on DACA advocacy and applications. We have our citizenship and naturalization program. And then we also have our immigration program within our legal department. We also have an education department, which has our citizenship classes, sometimes even English as a second language classes. We have parents who volunteer with our organization and also work with our local school district. And then we are also implementing a new health education program. And then we have our health and resources department which is where we focus a lot with different public benefits and any kind of general assistance. All right. So if I were to describe your client base, it would be immigrants, low income immigrants or all immigrants and low income people. Yeah, the latter. So immigrants and, and all income, low income people. Yes, correct. So you want to be specific about that. You say you navigate, you help them navigate. And what else? So we said navigational support for immigrants and citizens with the end goal to become knowledgeable, empowered members of society. All right. So you help immigrants and other low-income people navigate public systems correct to help them what was what do you help them do become knowledgeable empowered members of society why don't a you lot of our, mm -hmm. to em empower them correct to empower them to become, to become so it's support for immigrants and citizens to become knowledgeable, empowered members of society. Right. I like the navigation because that word makes it seems like there's a system that you got to help them get through. And then yes. you want some kind of descriptive words or something that says that just makes it urgent. So do you have any like story or statistic if you try to give somebody an idea of just how big the problem is, like there's this many people or um, you is there something about the current environment? Is it, you know, in the yes. of COVID or something? What kind of like little one-liner did you think you could use to spice that up? I mean, I'm very facts based. So I was very much going through looking through one of the grant proposals that we were working on so I could make sure that I would have that done accurately. So I'm still looking. All right. So when you talk- But for example, we are in a very underfunded area. Okay. Our community is very immigrant-based, low income. So you are you are a place-based in terms of your operation? Yes. So then uh, that might be helpful to mention the place is a, is a computer area. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? What is it in a particular community area or neighborhood? What's that neighborhood? Yes, so we are in Waukegan, Illinois. So very much up north. All right, that's very important. So you wanna have where you serve and then you might wanna throw in something about the, uh, the change of population in Waukegan, or, you know, this is now uh, the 
a hub, a population hub, or whatever particular need. But I think making it specific to Waukegan is important. And there's always, if you could say something, there's, did you know that they're, you know, the Waukegan area is now whatever percent poor or whatever percent immigrant? Something that might give it some urgency. Now, are you, uh, Ama, are you kind of looking at the word count here? Um, so I was trying to, I, so I just actually, if you look in the chat, I just added some examples because we haven't really finalized the full statement. I wanted to sort of get right. the statement in there, but. So let's look at what Alma um, has there. We help immigrants and other low income people. And it's like, I would say low income, maybe you could say low income families or individuals in Waukegan navigate essential public systems. So you want to say essential, something like that, that gives mm -hmm. it, that one word gives it some gravity. Essential. Okay. And you could say something like at the end, Waukegan is one of the fastest growing, has one of the fastest growing immigrant populations in the state. Now that last sentence, you could shorten that and just say, we help uh, immigrants and low-income people in Waukegan, you know, which is one of the fastest growing immigrant uh, areas in the state, navigate uh, essential public systems. Okay. Well, you yeah. okay. <laughs> I'd have to redo it and type Yeah, but I'm just I'm throwing it, it out there. <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to give the idea yeah. that you're taking the most essential words, you're putting them together so that it, in the most kind of conversational way, so that you don't use too much jargon and that you could get that out in any sentence. So if you're talking to a funder or even the lady down the street or the hardest uh, the hardest audience in the world, which is your mom trying to explain what you do. 100%. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you're talking to your mom. This is what we do. You yeah. see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a there's an old acronym called Keep It Simple Stupid. Yes. <laughs> Talk to me like I'm a, a fourth grader. Make yeah. me understand. And, you know, I, I, when we were doing this before, I noticed that as a hack, it's almost like 50% of the words you take out. Of yeah. The statement. It's like you don't you, need you half of them. And if like you, only using half. Yeah. That's exactly right. And if you think about it, actually, even more technically, you're taking out the kind of the, the linking kind of things, you know, the, the, you're just taking out all your really, if you, the best way to do this is to look at what you're saying and isolate those key words, either the nouns that are descriptive or the uh, action words, strip everything else out and then put your puzzle back together in a way that makes sense logically when you're speaking it. It's really like that. And that's something that you will have at the tip of your tongue all the time so that you can do that. And then the more complex things, the more detailed things come after. But this is the opening the door. This is the, the introduction. Right. So someone else, maybe from group two, want to talk about theirs? If or any other group. Because I think this is the more of these you see someone go through themselves, it demystifies it. And also makes this, you know, when you hear the new version, uh, it just like, so if you're working, if we're, as we're talking now, you've got yours in front of you, you take out to that and maybe you'll come up with something even now. So someone who's ready to go. Philip, I just got a quick question. I don't want to talk about this. I want someone else to, but can you move the slides? Cause I want to look at the other ones cause I came in late, I'm sorry. Oh, well, this is the, the most, had you seen this one? Yeah, I saw that one, but it's okay, the one after that that I didn't get to see. One. 
they're all relevant. Thank you. Which one? And again, you're gonna, there are, every one of these sessions, the video of the session is uh, put in that archive there, specifically for, so you can go there and hear the, an edited version of this session and all of the others. Yes. So I was waiting for um, the person in our group. My name is Felicia Saad. I am with Illinois Legal Aid Online. And the person who was in our group, I don't see her. So her mission statement is not available to us. But I go by, I, I let's use mine. Yes, um, I think that might be good. So uh, I, I put in here our tagline or our mission statement, right? We simplify the law so you can get justice. That's that's our, our, the, the first thing you see when you open our web page. Um, in ILEO, we're trying to make, uh, and this is, and we are going through a consultant firm right now to trying to uh, better off our, our, our website, uh, to take what is not working and to make it, or to keep what is working and make it better. So one of the things that we were talking about is the work, we simplify the law. Well, that's gonna, nearly impossible to do because the law is very complicated and we cannot change the law but we but we make it easy enough for people to understand it when they read it because we make it simple language and we make it at an eighth grade level reading but if i have an opportunity to you ask me so what are you doing at leo i'm a community navigator with at leo i lead at 18 navigators in the king into page county and we help people to uh, obtain justice by allowing them to uh, to open their eyes to what the law is. We, we empower them mm -hmm. by making the law accessible to them. So this is an online? Yes, we are an online platform. We've been on, in, uh, we are part of the Access to Justice and we uh, have been live since 20, we are just celebrating a 20 year. So I think the online is something that definitely should be in there because that would spark someone's interest. Mm -hmm. That makes it unique mm -hmm. that the service that you're providing is online based. Okay. Um, so I like what Ama has done. She's saying we simplify the legal process. Mm -hmm. I like simplifying the legal process or you could say legal access or access to legal services. So you can start where we are an online source of, uh, we are an online source of information that simplifies the legal process or, or, or legal access to who? Who's your client base? The community. Um, so is it is this an income based thing? Um, not necessarily. I mean, not necessarily. We have a, a we don't have a limit per se, but who comes to our our website, our low income. All right, then you could say something like the you're simplifying the the legal access or legal. I say I like access to people re, um, uh, regardless of ability to pay, something mm -hmm. like that, which implies it's open to low-income folks, but not exclusively because that's mm -hmm. what's more accurate. Yes. So something like regardless of ability to pay. Okay. To pay, okay. So it's in the chat as well. Yeah, so thank I you. like this, and I would, so if we were to take what Ama just put there, that I think that's really getting close. I, maybe we could take out source of information and we could say, we provide online legal access. We, legal access to people regardless of their ability to pay. Something like that. And then again, some other kind of 
word in there that's descriptive, like needed essential critical evil services, something that may bring some urgency with one word. And and that's accurate because we are we provide access to low cost attorney or not cost attorney. Sometimes they they do a pro bono because we're the with the access to justice, and we have well we I'm sure you are familiar with so many uh, partners who take cases and the pro bono basis. So right. So I like the I like that idea of uh, legal services or all of that. And, um, but I think you definitely, whatever you come up with has to have that online understanding and the idea that this is uh, something that's accessible to poor people. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So we should, well. You don't have to say poor people. If you say regardless of their ability to oh, pay. their ability to pay. That means yeah, they have I like access that one. to it. Yeah. And see how quickly we even reduce that down. We whittled that mm -hmm. down and yes. it's clearer. Yes. So, so I think that's clearer than what you started with. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because it went the other way. It's a little longer, mm -hmm. but it's more descriptive, I think. Descriptive, we provide one. Oh, okay. And I also, the thing about the online is it makes it very much like we're on the cutting edge. This is new, modern. This isn't some old stuff. We're being responsive. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that? Um, well, I will take that to our next meeting that we have with the consultant firm and with my, um, because we have a meeting about next week, I think. And oh, we I'm will sure. Present I'm this. sure that, yeah. Yes. So that's just an idea. Again, these it, are works yes. in progress. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's it, more, I guess the question I would really like to ask you is if you had to talk to a donor, if you had Elon Musk, is this something you could, you would feel comfortable saying to them? as a way of sparking conversation, maybe going to the next step. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The, the less, the better. Because when you get this jitters and, you know, you're awestruck by the fact that, oh, you're meeting somebody who has, you know, potential that can be uh, a changer. I mean, a life changer for a lot of people. Right. So you, you have to take the opportunity that you have at that moment to say, my name is Felicia and I am, you know, I work for Illinois Legal Aid Online. We uh, provide, we're an online critical, uh, an online source to provide legal services to people regardless with the ability to pay or not. Yeah. And, so and I like what Letty just put, um, <clears throat> offered. This one says, we are a leading expert, uh, ex expert resource to information mm -hmm. that simplifies <clears throat> the legal <throat> access and process for people regardless of their ability to pay. Okay. So I think that one longer. works more when you're or writing a, something. A proposal. I was going to say that's, that's, a, proposal. that's proposal language. That's proposal, yeah. right? And you want to like when you're talking to them, you want to stay to those action words, yeah. descriptive words, because that's how people talk. People don't right. speak right. this way. Casual speech, and also let's not mix pitch with a tagline. Okay, mm -hmm. because with the tagline, which is great, you can build off the tagline, but we simplify the law so you can get justice doesn't really tell us what you're mm -hmm. doing. But mm -hmm. saying that we we provide online critical legal acts, you know, something like that. So mm -hmm. just make sure that you you get a what you use what normally you will see in a proposal. That's mm -hmm. when you want to go from formal to casual. I see. So okay. it's, you take out a lot of the formal jargon, okay? And it'll leave you with casual speech. Right. You and want it that, to be casual that, speech. And see that simplify thing, that's more like your next follow-up statement right. that really says, you know, how, you know, you know that the accessing the law and stuff for people who aren't, you know, to have a lot of means, can be very complicated. We simplify that using online and see people get that right away. So it's just like, it's just trying to get you to that next step. So then you can hit them with the more detailed information. Mm -hmm. All right. So, it makes so, a lot of sense. Thank you. I hope you find that if, so does anybody want to do another more? Or do we want to move on to the, the next thing? If someone has a burning one, we can, do that because I really I think people learn from seeing someone else do it. 
And I want to tell you that it is very important to do this now and have it all ready, ready, practiced and ready to go. I'll yeah. tell you an example. Uh, one day I was in the elevator <laughs> <laughs> with <laughs> uh, Kwame Raoul. Uh-huh. Okay. And we were and we had to go up and it was just him and I, nobody yeah. else. Um, my hook could have been that, oh, our kids go to preschool together, you know, but had I had something prepared just in my mind, not that I knew I was going to be bumping into Kwame Raul, but the fact that if I'd had a pitch prepared period, bumping into him in the elevator, I could have spoke to him about our, our organization, our programs. And even if we weren't in his uh, representation area, at that point, I would have done a follow up. Who would be the person I would talk to about this, if not you? But I didn't have it prepared. So the only thing I could talk to him was like, oh, our kids go to preschool together. And then, you know, I felt like a heel when I was getting, I'm like, I can't believe I, you know, let an opportunity like that get away from me because I wasn't prepared with a pitch. Wow. Now that's a very powerful kind of way that we're talking about this because that's how it occurs. It occurs when you are not necessarily least expected. And then there's expected. somebody standing in front of you. But if it's on the tip of your tongue yes. and it just comes out like that, then that just opens it up and then you can get into the weeds and the details of stuff. And again, I mean, try it out on your mom, try it out on your kids, try it out about Try it out with somebody that is not familiar and wouldn't understand. And right. I, I just think it's a very powerful exercise. Yeah. So just work on those. If nobody, you know, there's no pressure here. We can kind of move on. Sure. So we've been talking about our pitch, right? Um, and we're developing this pitch for people, for mm -hmm. our donors, uh, individual donors, and those uh individuals that are part of foundations, okay? But so let's look right now at our individual donors. How do we identify them? Where do we get them from? We just don't go out and pull them off from a tree. We just don't, you know, they just don't sprout up from somewhere. Um, where do they come from? Well, we spoke about this in our last training. They are our colleagues. They're our family and friends. They're our employees. They are also people that are attached to employee giving programs. Those are individuals, okay? Your alumni, if you have alumni that uh, can give, there are some organizations where you probably can tap your alumni to give. Um, some of you may be able to attach, uh, tap your constituents uh, to give. Um, and then of course, you're looking at your board members, uh, former staffers and their networks. Can't tell you enough how important people's networks are. So when you ask people to give, you should ask them for their networks as well, okay? People like to brag when they give too. It's just another thing, okay? Um, and once you've identified those folks, okay, you wanna make sure that you are cultivating them and stewarding them as a donor. Number one, you wanna cultivate them by engaging them in your organization, getting them to know intimately what your organization does. You also want to get to know who they are, build that relationship with them before you ask, okay? Get them connected. And then once you've asked and they've given, you want to steward them. You want to make sure you keep them. You want to keep them engaged. You want to make sure that you're just not coming to them once a year with your handout. You want to make sure that you keep them engaged throughout the year. I say on average, you want to be engaging with them at least three times throughout the year. Okay, maybe one is an ask and two are just, hey, look what's going on. Look what, look what your money did this year, you know, that kind of thing. And then you come back around for that ask. So, and you have to identify somebody who is gonna be strategic in um, keeping in touch with your donors, okay? Um, so that's pretty much, you, you just wanna make sure you keep them engaged. You wanna be intentional about that. You don't want it to be hit or miss. You don't want it to be spotty, okay? Um, and you want to always make sure you keep um, a, 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 an opportunity open so that you can ask them for an increased gift or if they know other people, okay? So what we're going to do now is we are actually going to 
brainstorm a list of potential donors using the donor prospect list as your guide, okay? Some of you probably have already, you have a list that you, an extensive list, and some of you maybe are still at right now in the process of trying to build your donor list. Like who are those people that we can, we can um, ask, okay? Um, so once you're, you start to identify these individuals, I also want you to think about how would you engage them? Is this somebody that you would reach out to through a phone call, okay? Is this somebody that you would reach out through an email or a personal note? Or is it a peer-to-peer -peer contact? You know, a phone call or an email is usually if you really don't know the person or if you have somebody that's introducing the two of you, um, you may use the email. Personal note, maybe somebody who was given to your organization before, but it's fallen out. You haven't stayed in, in contact with them, but you know, you send a, a brief personal note to them. You know, you don't probably want to send an informal, I mean, I'm sorry, a formal cold um, message to you. That's something like, thank you for your, you know, your previous help and blah, blah, blah. You know, you want that's a you know a personal note. And if it's um a family friend or somebody that's connecting you, that's that peer-to-peer -peer contact, okay? So just think about that. Who are these people? And then if you put that next to them, then you know what that strategy is for engaging them. You want to be mindful of that because the way you would approach somebody who's new to your organization versus somebody who has been giving to you um, annually for the last five years, you wouldn't be sending the same thing to them. So you want to be mindful of how you even engage folks in your individual pipeline. Phil, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, that was great. And I would say this works, the, this exercise works on two levels. So this is what everyone should do, particularly given what we just said, like your mom, your brother-in-law, your cousins or whatever might not understand exactly what you do and may not understand that. So they're a great front line for getting contacts. And once you engage them, then what you're saying to them is spread the word. We're doing a fundraiser. We're raising money. Can you send this to your lists? Because remember the objective is to get viral. And when they send it to their list, they're gonna mm -hmm. personalize it because it's coming from someone they know. It's coming from their cousin, their mom. It's not like something completely cold as she's saying. So these relationship things are great starting points, not necessarily because you think you're gonna get a bunch of money from your family, but because your family and friends know people you don't know and they might be engaged and, and wanna do this thing. And back in the day, it was harder when all of these things had to be done with mail or personal contacts or blah, blah, blah. But now they can be done with email. People look at their email before they look at their mail. And they check their email before they check their voice messages. And if this is coming from somebody I know and trust, I at least might click on to it, if, especially if there's something intriguing about it. But if it came from my boy, my girl, my mama, I'm going to look at that first. Yeah. So what you're doing today with yourself is powerful to do it with groups of people, a group from your board. Have them all do it. You know, have make it up like a bingo where there's some kind of prize for the most number of names. Make it fun. You know, and pe again, people can shoot these lists out in a way that was much easier ever before just because of technology. So that's what you're thinking about. You're thinking about it for yourself, but think about doing this with groups of other people that are your circles, maybe established donors already. Did he say, well, look, we're doing this major push. We, we need you to kind of write some of these things down, identify some of the names right now. And the first thing is just do their name. Don't, you don't have to have an email or whatever. Just right. think of whoever, so my, the guy who does my taxes or the people next door. You know, they seem like they really care about social issues or blah, blah, blah. And then once you get them, it's evangelizing them to do the same thing. So I, I hope that's helpful. So, and so this is a competition, right? 
<laughs> so yeah. we're going to be looking for the uh, top two people who give the longest list, okay? Top two people will get a free copy of Chicago is not broke, okay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so all you'll need to do, we're going to put it in the chat. You'll email uh, Tom with your name and shipping address with the subject line, I'm a big winner. We're going to put it in the chat. <laughs> so we'll see. So we're going to give you about um, about seven minutes or so. Yeah. Just come up with a list. We want you to be um, stream of consciousness. Don't, don't freak out too much yeah but go into those categories and just first names or whatever or whatever's going to jog you okay and then after you've done it you all compare how many you all came up with in your group all right have any questions all right here we go the list hopefully we got, <laughs> hopefully we got it right <laughs> okay so um i think we're all back now yes we are so why don't you go ahead and put in the chat how many you got on your list? Oh, okay. And then we'll, we'll take a look at that. And as you're putting that in, um, how did that go for you? How, you know, was it easy for you to think about individuals? Did, was it a stretch or were there individuals that popped into your mind that at, at some point you didn't even think that, oh, these would be potential individual donors? Um, if I engage them, you know, or you didn't, you know, just are there groups of people that you didn't even think about? Like, how did your list change? Maybe even if you already had an existing list, were there other folks that you uh, put on your list? Anybody can jump in. Yes. And I think even like with the idea of colleagues or coworkers, we don't necessarily think about that in this realm, right? Like we're trying to get people outside. But the whole way this works with individual giving in particular, and a lot of things that have to do with, with the nonprofit itself, it emanates from a core, the core that's most familiar to you, the most familiar to each person you're talking to, because that way they can radiate out on their own relationships, on the strength of their own credibility. And you're borrowing that credibility for them. And then people, obviously, you could talk to people with your staff, like, hey, you know, we need to raise money. You know that we need to keep this saying you can help. And you do it in some kind of a setting where maybe you got coffee and donuts, you have some kind of prize. It could be just something. I like the group thing because you get you you introduce an element of competition and po folks just respond to that, even if the things. It's not like this is Las Vegas and there's big stakes or something, but if it's more like bingo, it's fun. If you could do it in an interactive thing, you, it's really a good iterative generating process. So Letty's got 15, anybody got more? She might've scared everybody. I know, <laughs> I was about to say that. I'm like, oh, come on guys. But the point is you got 15 friends. You got everybody on here is cool enough that they got 15 friends. We got so much more than that. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah, and I know. Don't be shy. So Philip, you know, if, if I could jump your, in. Uh, your elevator speech, you can now explain what you do to folks that, you know, before it's like, uh, you know, I, what does that mean? So you see what I'm saying? It all kind of works together. Exactly. Somebody has their hand up. Yeah. So so I put, um, or we put, so it was um, Diego and Devin and myself. We put board members and we weren't, we were kind of like, okay, are we looking for specific names or potential titles of things? So we put board members, banks, local retailers, because they got small little um, grant budgets for every quarter, lawyers slash law firms, friends that are influential, meaning they got some networks, they know how to trigger people, classmates, alumni networks, small networks, um, small business networks, my apologies, local government, like aldermen, right? They end up finding out about pockets of money or can trigger some things. Um, judges, because it's not necessary that that judge is working on something, but sometimes they have money and they want to give because as a person, they want to do something like that. Colleges, um, through emails, phone slash text campaigns, Facebook, medical field like doctors, um, and employee giving, you know, there's some companies that do that. So that was kind of some of the things that we got to in really 16. So those are great categories. And so the, the job then is to 
in each one of those, drill down with specific names, contacts, figure out how you're going to contact them. And again, um, the stronger your personal relationship with them, I think it's easier that you can initiate that. Mm -hmm. Elida? So, Elida? Yeah, you had a question or a comment? Um, uh, yes, it was a little bit hard because like a specific name, sometimes I don't know the name, but I know who's the institution, the partner institution, let's say, for example, my organization where I part of, right? We are a member of four institutions. They can be possible donors. And sometimes um, church, mosques, uh, all kind of religion. I mean, that's um, prospect donors. Like if I see them bigger, but I don't know the names. Um, and also um, not all the time I'm going to receive money and the fact of donors, it can be trainings, it can be um, material, but sometimes I don't get the money, but if I find like both of you can be post my prospect donors for the next time on training. So like, but the names is so hard for me, especially my memory doesn't work properly with names. So it's hard to name all the people. So like she mentioned, um, she take a lot of mine, but um, electoral official clinical, local clinicals, but also hospitals, the big hospitals that are partnership, like let's say Cook County, they have 13 or 16, um, sites that they can be possible donors so i have 14 over there uh but um it's so hard to mention names and i don't know if it's okay sometimes in no go it can be money but it can be trainings uh and all educational um, donations uh, listen please do not diminish in-kind donations they can save your organization a ton of money Okay, so I love that you brought that up, Eladef, that yes, it may not be monetary, but it definitely that, that donation, that service, that free service, that pro bono service does carry a monetary expense that is saving your organization. So yes, you know, I mean, of course you wanna take what you can get and you take what is useful for you as well, right? So yes, in-kind donations are huge. That's part of your, your donor giving. That's something that you would put on that budget to show income, okay? That when we went over the budget, you saw there was a whole line item for that. So yes, absolutely. And I like that. Um, if you are trying to figure out like what, who, where do I go? I love the fact that you both uh, gave like subject areas and then you can then further drill down in those subject areas. So. It only it may look like 15 subject areas, but under that there's like so many other people, you know. Oh, you've got you hundreds, if not thousands, yeah. so from those like categories, if you think about it this way. Absolutely. So I might not know everybody at that organization or that church or whatever, but I know this person or this key person. I'm gonna work with them to drill down in there and 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 you know you use the leverage of the relationship you may have with that entity or whatever to give you more. And um, in the, I would tell, say two cautionary um, uh, categories are politicians and churches because they're raising their own money. And so they're less likely to turn over anything like that to you. But their gatherings, their meetings where you have access and you can be in there with folks are where you can start to do that without let, you know, being, hey, I'm coming into your church to raise money and I need as many donors as I can. Pastor's not going to say yes, at least not on the mm -hmm. South Side. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey, Philip, can I jump in? <laughs> sure. Can I? Sure. Thank you. And um, politicians. So politicians are always raising money for their own campaigns. So you got to understand it. So you have to be clever with those two categories, I think. I got some um, uh, recommendations and some ideas. One is with the hospital systems. Um, go meet your local hospital systems that are in your area and then find out what funding budgets they have for community because. Um, FYI to everybody on here, the FBI and Homeland Security have courses called the FBI or, or um, HSI Citizens Academy, and I was in both. And the people that are invited to be a part of these private cohorts of learning, 
um, are very influential. And so then you end up learning within there, not only what Homeland Security and FBI are doing, because it's about building relationships, but you end up learning about what their, what their needs are, what they have to do for community. And in the FBI one, there was someone from a hospital system. I think it was that children's lawry thing. And then she talked about how they were regulated by the state to reflect what they were doing in community and the monetary give to the local community. And I thought, oh, that's so good that um, she shared that because I never really thought about that. And then if you guys ever want to learn about how to get into those, you know, feel free to, you know, I'll put my email in there um, and I can do recommendations. Um, it's very high level, meaning that they're looking towards organizations because they have nonprofits in there as well, that really like, where is your mission and community? What is your impact? You know, um, and so trying to build those relationships. Anyways, I hope that helps. That does. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I hope that the overall message here has been that you have, if you're even just starting an individual giving program, you have more potential resources at your disposal than you think you have. You just have to look at the same people, the same institutions you've been interacting with in another way and how to elicit for them the more names. And again, it's become so much simpler in this digital online age in terms of facilitating pushing out a message through a group and it, it really can take on a viral quality if you if you do this right absolutely we had so something cool. we had so something please. like that uh oh the um person from Wakiga, I, I lenoria is what i remember her last name said uh, by being located in a really uh, low income area, you're reluctant to, to ask from the people that you are serving. But I, I, I think that you can't underestimate anyone. You know, yes. People, people exactly. do what they want to do. And if they really believe, they will, they will come and they will do what, they, what you would like them to do. Uh, I think if you look at some of the beautiful churches that are built in the very low income areas, you can see that they recognize it helps the whole community. And that is a powerful thing, but it also requires those connections you were talking about. I had my own moment yesterday when or recently, I guess it was, because there's I've been told that donors, especially corporate donors, really like to ask, what kind of support do you have for this incident or this uh, campaign within your organization, your employees? Absolutely. And so I tried to wrestle with it because, you know, our, our pay is not high. And uh, finally, my boss said, well, you know, if they gave a dime, we'll work it out. But everybody that we, that we work with actually gives so much all the time, whether it be that extra gas to take the, the papers for filing or, you know, to do the last minute thing that you never put on the, the pay reimbursement or that you never put on the hours that you spend. And I said, then that's the in kind that I want them to understand. So yesterday I sent out something like that. And I said, I'm a little nervous on putting this out because I'm going to ask you for donations, but I want you to talk with me because, and then I told them how I really believe there's more to us. I mean, there's more to our personal worth than the money, each of us. And that's what I want to capitalize. Uh, Kathy, oh, you went out. I think you might've muted yourself. Did you, or is that me? She went out, I can't hear you. Yeah, she went out. Okay. Oh, there okay. you are. Uh, I asked him and uh, haven't had any response yet. <laughs> you know, though, but I, I like the, the approach and actually what 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 could it hurt if you even had staff in kind that's something that i think would be a it's empowering one for your staff two it really tracks wow look at what the staff does and then you might want to think about wellness and all that other kind of stuff that goes along with that and then you do want to quantify that for your your funders i think it's very very important 
Um, and it, I think that's something that I don't know if there's any other organizations that have done that or are thinking about that. But that's something that in an organization that I used to work, we never did that. And definitely there was a lot of in-kind energy <laughs> going mm -hmm. on. And if we had quantified, because I never put in for transportation reimbursement ever, because I understood the cost to the organization, of course, as a resource development person, I'm like, no, no, it was hard to, you know, get that money in the first place. Let's leave it there. I can handle it. But that is sort of a give back to the organization. You yeah. know, and to quantify that, I think that's- And again, that's even their thing. colleague, their contacts, getting them to open up about, okay, well, maybe you can't give this, but you can get it. You can open up a, re, you know, this reservoir of your personal contacts. You believe in this work. Mm -hmm. It's in their self-interest to do it or whatever. And that kind of uh, demonstration to a funder is very powerful. Yes. All of them want to know if, what's your percentage of board giving and all of that. So it's using those little cohorts, digging in deep with these kind of maybe bingo nights, social nights where you're kind of easing into that and you know lowering people's uh, guard. And um, it can really, I, it, it can be a very fruitful thing. Yeah. So if uh, we, we want to get to the next section, does anybody else want to chime in here? That Thank you very much, Kathy. And Letty let said, some government officials do fundraising to give, uh, like Congressman Robin Kelly with yep. her nonprofit called Delicate Balance. Yes, that's absolutely yeah. right. Some of them do have. Yeah. And one thing I want to add to that, um, on Sunday, and it was um, some an influential guy who's a comedian, he does events, so he's a producer of events. It was his birthday and he did a request to the network, which is very large. And he said, hey, there's these little kids and you know, one of them, I think he's about to pass. And he's trying to do fundraising for this, these families because it touched his heart. And he said, can you bring a fuel mm -hmm. card or an Aldi card um, you know, to my birthday get together at a little restaurant? in the city and I went in with some friends and we were all just like giving. And so you never know what that give looks like. Exactly. You never know who's gonna be emotionally moved like him. He's constantly uh -huh. doing things like this, but people would not think of that. They'd be like, well, he's a comedian and he produces shows, so why would he do that? So I think it's again, the, the, the stuff that we create in our minds of who we should and shouldn't reach. That's the, <laughs> that is the bottom line right there. If we create that in our mind and so, don't do the other person's thinking for them. Right. Don't don't assume. And go out yes. there and, yes. and do your thing. So I think that, yes. that is great, lady. Absolutely. Thank you for that, lady. That's huge. Thank you. That's huge. All right. Well, let's uh, move on. We're going to be talking about special events fundraising. Go ahead. Bill. So this is similar. We remember from the uh, grassroots fundraising where we talked about defining your intent and doing all of this checklist to uh, do fundraising events. So I guess today what we wanted to really look at is does anybody have a particular fundraising event where they've, uh, they're thinking about a strategy, maybe it's not fully formed or anything like that, but they, they've got this idea, they know what their uh, budget might be available for this. They wanna, is this gonna be online or something in person? Um, I think at this point, people could just share. They have something that is like that. Um, instead of going out into a group, let, if anybody wants to brainstorm something that they have that they've done, or maybe they want to reverse engineer for something that just happened, or anything like around special events, was it virtual, was it in person? Was it more of a friend raiser where you didn't have big money expectations, but you were trying to cultivate those relationships? Was that your goal? And, um, you know, if it's something that's upcoming, what's your timeline for doing that? So does anybody have anything top of mind or anything that they were planning at their organization? Let me see. Or anything you were thinking of, you know, like, is anything... that you're even thinking of that that maybe you haven't implemented yet? Mm -hmm. We have a <clears throat> we have a fun. I'm sorry, a friend raising event going on, and we have a fin 
it's a development committee that is taking charge of this. Mm -hmm. The town is Peoria, which is about 40 minutes away, 45 minutes away. And uh, it's close enough, but far enough that there still is a distance. So it looks like it's going very well. They're making the connections and setting things up. Um, and it will be in person. Okay, what, what kind of event is it? Um, after work, chips and salsa and meet us, greet us, you know, greet them. And we'll have a little presentation, um, introduction. It's just sort of captive audience in a, in a way, mm -hmm. but um, these are people that have already worked with the immigration folks here, but in Peoria All to right. a great extent. And so what's your target for how many people? <clears throat> you know, I don't know. That part is, this committee pretty well takes it on its own. They do their own thing and we have a meeting next week. Um, I'm guessing 20. All right. From is the way they were talking. What, what kind of venue is this going to be in? It's going to be the above a world eatery. Uh, what do you call it? International food eatery. And okay. it's pretty well known. Mm -hmm. A mixer after in a, in a. Yeah. Okay, and yeah, in an international type of setting. Yeah. And they're bringing people that they know. That they know and that the people that they know that they know, I think. That they know, great. So it's like, a, yeah. come, in, come here, we're going to have some great eats, you're going to meet some yeah. great people, and you're going to hear about a great organization. We want you to hear about us. That can, We want you to know what we're doing because we think it affects everybody. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, do you have, we, you know, we talked a, a little bit in, in previous discussions about uh, ambassadors and spokesmen that might be from internal ex-clients, alumni, or someone who's worked with you? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that you're good, that's part of it. Some of the staff, yeah. The, the real stories. I mean, you don't have to make these up. These are real. So, and, and I don't think any of us have to make any of them up. They're real. Think of what Zelensky did yesterday. That was powerful. Yes. And we may end up doing some kind of a video because I heard you mention video in, in this too. Uh, we'll just see what happens. It's they, they have the ability to reach the emotions, which evidently is pretty close to the pay, to the billfold in a lot of cases. You know, you may, I like the idea of maybe having something videotaped that you could use and edit for other purposes of people like that talking in their behalf. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing that you could do, especially with video, is um, nobody sees that it's only 20 people. You know, it could yeah. have the appearance of, you know, we got a bunch of people here and people like to get on a moving train. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they really do. Yeah, they do. Yeah. You can hop on. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> I saw this you know, it's, it's, yeah. That's, uh -huh. yeah. That's a great, you know, and that's, um, that is one of those, those events that you, you can't lose. Honestly, you can't lose. And you might even want to do, it's, it's always good to have the ask there too. It's always oh, yeah. good to have that ask there, yeah. you know, um, you can't lose with a, uh, an event like that. And it's low maintenance. Okay, it's not like you're putting on a gala. You know, galas are pretty big. And all. this is one of those low maintenance ones that, you know, think uh, house parties even as special events. Smaller, uh -huh. uh, smaller events. So like what you're doing, but just, you know, more of those. Um, and then, you oh, know- Oh yeah, you know, I'm, I've worked with organizations where there's a board member or a friend of the organization that has a really nice house or yes. a really nice place. And so they will host it. Mm-hmm. And so people, people like leave, to you know, come to those. Oh, they yeah. love those. Those yes. love those. So that's a that's a good one. And hopefully this has sparked ideas for folks. I mean, I, you know, that was the intent of this. Yeah, especially I'm impressed with them. They're big and, you know, land. If you've got the budget and you've got the energy and the manpower, fine. And, you know, if you know that's your goal, but these things can be done small and they can be deep. Just because it's five people in the room, if you've got five major donors in the room, 
you know? So mm -hmm. it, you and just I, the energy like in this case, a lot of it's coming from other people who are energized. It doesn't take a lot away from you and your, what you've got to get done day to day. Right. And so that's the best of all worlds. And if they feel, if that cohort, that, that, that group you have that did this feels good after, um, they'll yeah. want to do it again. Yeah. So this is really, that's all good stuff. That's a great one. Thank you, Kathy. You're so welcome. we want to respect your time. We got, I want to go quickly over the last thing that we had planned, and that was to go on to a website. Um, so what this next thing is really about is we're going to walk through an actual funder website. So to really get around the idea of alignment an approach. Again, you some of this will be calling the funder using that new elevator pitch we have. Um, and also just understanding uh, what to look for in the different parts of what they're presenting on their website, talking about the different tricks of trade that harken back to when we were talking about grant writing and even some of the things we've talked to today. So let me share my screen. All right. Let's move this up. All right, is that better? You're not gonna see the whole screen at once, but I, Lisa, you can see the navigation. All right, so this is the Lawyers Trust Fund of Illinois. Does anyone on the call currently uh, receive funding from them? You can put yes in the chat. You can put yes in the chat. And then as we talked about, if you're prospecting, you're looking at their website and you want to kind of get a, an understanding of whether or not you fit, before you even look at the guidelines, you can look at their grants and you can look at their grantees. And are, is anybody like you? And then you can see how much they've gotten. All of this is public information. And you could go down that. That's just basically their, their current grants. If you're looking at these grants, they also talk about different initiatives and how to apply in the guidelines. So let's go to the guidelines. So here are their guidelines. They make grants to nonprofits that provide legal aid to low-income residents. All right. They say that they are the la largest single source of funding for the legal aid system in Illinois. And that was probably true before this coalition, so, but they're probably the biggest private source, I would say. And then it gives you kind of an overview of their process. And you see kind of here where they have their deadlines, their cycles. And then if we go to the actual grant line guidelines themselves, that's very big. There we go. Does this look big for you all? It's a little big, but I mean, we get the gist. Yeah. So you could go down to the different sections. If you look at... Uh, who's eligible, 
direct direct legal services. That's what their grants are limited to. They you look at the exceptional statements like support for law schools only if they don't make grants to support to persons of med mediation services. So any place where it says do not, we do not do that. That's where you look to see, to make that critical determination of fit. Mm -hmm. um, then they're talking about the things about uh, provide services without charge. And at least one employee has to be a full-time staff attorney that's licensed. Now, they have an exception to that. So then you go to their exception part. That's part of a later part of their, their uh, application here. <coughs> and here it has, what's their criteria? How do they grant these? Now, now that you may fit, how do you be competitive? And you're competitive in the sense of what the quality of your service delivery and the scope of the work. And do you address the needs that align with them? And what are the levels of services and their demographic? This is when you're making all of your case. And they talk about the things that we talked about earlier, your organizational capacity, your infrastructure, your leadership, your governance, all of those things we're talking about. This is where it comes up. You're going to make cases for these. You're going to, in fact, the most efficient way to do this, if you're responding to them in a letter of inquiry or anything, take their criteria and write around it. Use their language so that the person reviewing it doesn't have to find stuff and then make a determination of where it might fit in their decision making. You're putting it there so that you're guiding their decision making with your language by using their language. Does that make sense? So there's something that I do when I send out an email uh, for the first time when I'm connecting with a, a program officer, I go straight to their website, I go into their guidelines and I pull whatever section um, or even if it's um, organizational um, general operating, we'll talk about it in a minute. I will take a statement or something specific, a fact right from their, their website and drop it right in that email and say, I feel, I think that we are aligned and I'd like to talk to you more because of blah, blah, blah. You believe blah, blah, blah. And so do we, we do this, da, da, da. It, and it's only one or two sentences, but it shows them, oh, okay. I see what they're, what they're talking about. Okay, they see the alignment. This is where they're saying the rubber meets the road with us. And so now we're gonna talk based on that. It's not, it's not so open and general but it's that this is what we do. And we see this per your guidelines. This is where we are aligned. There so is, that is a pro tip, Abba. That is like, that's the height of this art. Hey, it is, right. kind of, their words. Uh, Drop it right in. It's, it's grant seeking jujitsu. <laughs> because what you're doing is you're taking their thing and switching that momentum around. I'm using your language. I'm incorporating your buzz terms. And I'm you saying that that you fit us. Right. We fit. You can see it. I I don't have to, you don't have to go looking through or figuring out from what you said. I made the connection for you. So you take control of the conversation. And that's the better position that you want to be in when you're doing this. Absolutely. So this page, we're going down and we're looking at their. You want to always check these deadlines, where you fit in them. Don't miss the deadlines. If they're informational se sessions, go to the informational sessions, attend these Zooms, so you know exactly a lot of the questions you might have, they will have them. They, they, somebody else is going to have the same question. And here's the thing. The, the program officers are going to expect that you've read the, the guidelines. Yes. So if there's something explicit in the guidelines and you're calling them to ask them, they're going to you know, they're going to look at you. I can't say enough. The first thing you do is look at the guidelines. Um, 
I would tell people, I used to have to remind myself before I run off and start doing, oh, there's some funding. Read the RFP. Absolutely. Read the guidelines. You may not be a fit and you have gone all over trying to get all this stuff and then you're not going to get funded. The first thing you do is read the guidelines. And to that point, there, if there are bright line things that say you don't fit this and you can see that, then don't do it. Yeah, don't Unless don't. what you're going to do is contact them and say, look, we're kind of close to you or I'm, I'm questioning whether or not we're close to you. And if the if you get a good conversation going with the program officer, they, you can always ask them, well, you know the other funders, can you give me some referrals of other foundations I might look for? And mostly program officers are pretty cool with that because that means I don't get a lot of bad requests. I feel like I'm getting some help to this person. And so always ask them. So. Here, this particular foundation has a has a what they call an open door policy where you can call them. That's the best of all, all worlds. Yes. <laughs> when you can actually talk to them. And then the, most of their process is an online portal. So these are very cool mm -hmm. guidelines in that respect. And I do want to add that this is 20, good stuff. The, if you want to talk about that, no doesn't always mean no. And special, right? Them. Yeah, that's it. So the no. So if you get through this process and you're told no, as we talked about before, there's different no's. There's an absolute no because you don't fit our guidelines. There's no. We remember we had those concentric circles of us, the foundation, and there's there's no fit here. We're just like not here. Or maybe there's something where. There could be a program thing, but we need you to tweak something. That could be the no. It's a no, but I need a tweak. It could be a no because this is this other element. If they can be articulate about that, it could be a no just because of fiscal things. Mm -hmm. um, we're in that part of our program. We have already mm -hmm. kind of oversubscribed this year, but check next year and, and get some guidance about that. Is it, is it worth our while to keep approaching this foundation because all no's aren't the same no's. And again, it's it's an opportunity to establish the relationship that you're looking for. So I think we can stop there. You can always go look up this uh, legal trust fund, lawyers trust fund in Illinois, very simple, ltf.org. But I think that uh, you will find that that is a, a you know, if you haven't uh, gotten money from them before, that, that they're a great source. You've got three folks on, on this training that actually three organizations that do get funding from them. One of them gets general operating, which is music to any organization's ears that they literally, because most, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of uh, funders usually do the program project. Um, and, and it's very hard to get at those general operating funds, but this- And is so what that says is there's a complete alignment between mm -hmm. what they do and what the foundation will fund. So that the foundation is secure about the fact that um, nothing they're giving their money for is outside of their guidelines. That's what they want to know. So is there anybody else? Uh, that was Felicia. Um, I'm just curious uh, if the other folks, are you getting program funding or are you getting uh, general operating funding? I'm sorry about that. How does How is that working with you all? Um, Kathy, is yours program or general operating? Our grants are program. Got it. Um, and then there was one other person, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Devin. Devin, what, how is yours? Um, you receive uh, program funding. Excellent. Okay. Um, so you see, there's an even mix there of program fund. Well, there's program funding and there's general operating. So depending on how you align, 
you know, but definitely I, I, um, I really ask everybody go on there and let, look to see if you do align with them. That's, and the uh, more of these you do, if you're familiar <laughs> with it, you start to pick up where I need to look, right? where I need to focus, focus, focus first so that, you know, you don't waste anybody's time. Including right. your own. So I think we've talked about just seek alignment, look, go down that, look at their criteria and see, does it match? And look at the other organizations. You got three organizations in the room right now who uh, receive funding. Uh, do you, is your program of similar ecology? organization of similar ecology to these other organizations if so that's a, it's a good avenue to start going down you may want to contact that program officer and we respect we're talking that program officer if you're using language that's simplified like the elevator pitch you're more likely to establish a basis of a colleague to colleague peer-to-peer -peer understanding because they know you're not just reading something they know you're cutting through, and now you can get a deeper level of relationship. So we're kind of at the end. Hopefully this, this was good. If you could give us some feedback, whether or not this was good, you want to see more sessions like this that are interactive around different subject. We've already kind of gone internally around the con concept of maybe doing a 201 series going in deep uh, particularly around the federal grants, that that was a big interest that was expressed. So um, please, the evaluations really, really help us uh, formulate and, and calibrate uh, these sessions we give you. So we did put it in the chat a few times. I'm putting it in the chat right now. I'm giving you some time to, um, before you hop off, if you could just take these last few moments and fill it out. Um, like I said, it does really help us formulate things moving forward, make adjustments, add things, you know. And so it communicates actually to the coalition that, absolutely. you know, what are the things that this was helpful, that they'll provide more of these things and in different ways. So all of this really helps the process. So it's in the chat again, if you can just take, it doesn't take more than five minutes, even less than that. You take the last three minutes or so and you know, just let us know that you've done it as you exit. That would be wonderful. And as you're doing that, just to let you know, the next upcoming um, immigration cohort workshop is Civic Engagement 101 and that it's in March, okay? The end of the month, same bad channel, same bad time. Yeah, we hope and to see uh, your organizations again represented it's critical stuff. It's like, you know, and again, we try to be as thorough um, and systematic about approaching this uh, as possible. And um, so please, we hope to see you all there and, um, and give us some more of your great musical suggestions. <laughs> um, that's all really good stuff. So thank you. And uh, we'll see you all on uh, March the 31st. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Diego. I'm a, is there an evaluation form for this? I have lost it. Oh, okay. It's in the oh, uh, monkey. chat. Do you see okay. it? Yes. I got Thank it. Thank you. No Thank problem. you. Thank you for Thank asking. You. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Maria, thank you, Felicia, Litska, Lydia, Joanne, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, Elida. Thank, Thank you. you. Amazing. Thank you. I'm, I'm learning a lot. This is the first time I'm joining um, this kind of um, for fundraising. I'm not a point person, but uh, it helps me to support. And when it's like side visit, when they need testimony for my parent mentor program, how that I can work, how prepare them, especially this. 
um, it was for me amazing. Thank you so much. That for this been, opportunity. That's music to a development director. Absolutely. Here. That's what we want to hear. To hear that, awesome. that's awesome. Thank you so it's much. Like, I don't know. It's even, I know you're going to send everything, but I'm the old style. No work for me. <laughs> that's true. Awesome. Thank I'm you. Have an amazing that. day. Bye bye. Take care. Too. Have a great day. And again, thank, thank you, Sister Kathy. Yes. <laughs> for us up thank with the you old school. All your input. Honestly, it helped. I had the biggest crush on Sister Sledge when I was. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even lie about it. I, I was, one day I was I was uh I was in high school. I went to St. Ignatius and I had a uh, a job being a messenger for law firms. And one day I was walking and I was maybe a freshman in high school and they were doing an in-person appearance at a record store right there on Randolph. <laughs> oh, you lost and, your mind. And, um, it was packed with people and they were right by like kind of the window. And I had this biggest crush on Kathy Sledge and she <laughs> waved at me. <laughs> And I, was done. I probably almost got hit by a car walking around. <laughs> I was done. So yeah, wow. it's just a slave. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. So thanks, Kathy. You really helped out a lot with your insights. Well, yeah. thank you so much. I had no idea what to expect, but I am so pleasantly surprised and just thrilled. I've been using your stuff. Oh, thank you. That's wonderful. Cool. And and uh, uh, please proselytize and evangelize for this. I will. So people know there's a real value at it. That's that's what we're concerned about. That yeah. We're giving you stuff you can yeah. do. Yeah. Well, I'll bid you farewell.